Welcome to the Hoof and Fang Podcast. I'm Kurt Graves. And I'm Masmatics. So happy you guys are here joining us for our sixth episode. We're, we're doing good. Trucking along. Up to Unbelie- six now. Up to six. Up to six. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're just starting to see double digits. We're right there. chasing they're it down. They're on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. The momentum is in our favor. Yes. Um, how are you? Good. Tired. It's You're been- not good. That's a lie. <laughs> When we spoke earlier, you told me the truth. Yeah. Well, we said we weren't going to bullshit people on this podcast. You know podcast. what? You're right. You're holding me accountable. Mm-hmm. I'm, I shouldn't be bullshitting. Uh, I'm very tired yeah. and uh, stressed and the day job sucks right now. So that's where I live right now. That's the Is whole that, truth. That's the whole truth. The unvarnished reality of your yeah. life. Yes. And uh, I'm just, I'm and, and like I'm on vacation next weekend. And when we're recording this, I'm like two days away from not having to deal with anyone's bullshit for a whole week so being able to try to keep up that momentum and not just tell people to go to hell Mm -hmm. has been like my daily struggle this week right so yeah that is hard that is is hard Mm -hmm. Uh, are you working on anything at the moment Uh, i mean the day job your day job yeah which is taking up a lot of your time and energy yeah the day job has kind of zapped my energy this week so really nothing i and it's also putting me in a almost not negative headspace when i sit down to write but more critical of myself when I sit down to write. If I'm, I've already had a day where I'm having to make decisions all day and arguing with people and blah blah blah. So I'm working on that little dinosaur anthology thing. It was I loved it last week. Mm. This week I hate it. Like I'm reading it and I'm like, this story's boring. I don't like it. And of course, when I run it through Jess, she's like, it's fine. And I'm like, no, it's crap. Like right. there's there's no conflict and stuff. She's like, it's a ten thousand word short story. What do you, <laughs> what do you want them like to right. do? You know. So. Yeah, I, I think next week when I'm rested and I'm not like fresh off of arguing with people, I'll probably be like, oh, this is actually very cute and I could just like finish it out in right. the day. But yeah, it's it hasn't been a great week creatively, but that happens. Well, and from what I understand of our earlier conversations, mm-hmm. they ruined your release day with some <sighs> bullshit on Man, Friday. They really did. I was I didn't even get a chance to do my normal little, like I talked about like burritoing and yeah. turtling and stuff. I didn't get to do any of that because we had big projects dropped in our lap with zero reason behind them. So yeah, I, I went from being really, really excited about my release day and it went great. Like I, the reviews went off without a hitch. The, uh, you know, Amazon didn't do anything funky with my book or eat a cover or, you know, all the weird right, stuff that right. it can do. So all in all, great release, but I didn't have really any chance to, I don't know, sell it. Well, not sell it, like just sit with it and be happy with it. Right. I was I was dealing with too much garbage, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a good release. It was fine. So I, I think maybe I'll do a do over during my right. vacation. You know what I mean? Like that Friday, <laughs> just like go get some margaritas and be like, this is the real release yeah, day to me. <laughs> do it. <laughs> yeah. Do it. Let's do it. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. We're adults. We can go drink places. We can. We never do. Yeah, we don't. (laughs) (laughs) We keep doing other shit instead of like taking breaks. So yeah, if one of us remembers next Friday, let's go get some margaritas. I'm not talking about next Friday. I'm talking about this Friday. Oh shit. Your vacation starts, man. Oh, okay. Are you busy tomorrow? No. Okay. Well then. Am I? I I never am. Why would I be? Why would this week be any different? (laughs) Because that's my luck. Plans? No, I don't. (laughs) Okay, well then, don't. We'll go get some margaritas. Margaritas, it is. Yeah, awesome. Um, and you know what? Let's just get tacos while we're there, so that way I don't have to worry about cooking. Perfect. (laughs) You know what? We're just going to tell our our spouses Mm -hmm. to fend for themselves. We're going to go get margaritas and tacos. They are not invited. (laughs) John, (laughs) listen to the podcast tomorrow morning, so you know what we're doing tomorrow (laughs) night. (laughs) So you're not like, um, where's dinner? Oh, yeah. Clearly don't listen clearly to the show. Listen to the, podcast. <laughs> the scary thing is he is actually listening. He's behind, which is fine. <laughs> but I was like, oh, I didn't, I guess I didn't think you'd actually be listening. And I was like, I hope I, I, hope I didn't say anything. Yeah. Al- Alex sprung that on. He's like, I- I've been listening to your podcast. And I was like, great. Oh. I was like, I haven't talked to any shit, right? <laughs> no, I think I've been, I've been thinking I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so. Yeah, I, I thought about you, obviously, on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've been gone, so I haven't been doing any work. Um, I just got back today, and I'll hop in the booth again tomorrow. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I was like, oh, 
when you told me this morning about how yeah. Friday went, I was like, no. Yeah, it was kind we of We had that whole conversation last week about how you need to celebrate. Yeah. And actually, like, enjoy it. And I'm like, oh, well. Yeah, it's okay. I was like, I'll, grand, I'll, I'll talk to her about it on the podcast. I, yeah, for sure. I, do you do that now? Sometimes where I'm like, oh, I want to talk to Maz about something, but I'm, I'm going to save it for when there's <laughs> <laughs> the mics are on. I mean. Yeah, because <laughs> I, sure, I want it to be like a genuine conversation mm-hmm. and response. So if we like talk about it earlier and then try to recreate it, it's not the same. Right. So I try to hold on to the little fun things to talk about right. until we're here. Yeah. Although I will say, uh, I, I feel comfortable sharing this now. Mm-hmm. We did a f- damn good job of recreating our conversations we for episode did. two because like yeah. John was listening to the podcast uh, and he was listening to episode two. And I was like, you can't even tell we totally re-recorded this entire conversation we because did. we had technical issues with the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was very proud of us. We we acted our way through that like, gin- like oh, I haven't heard this mm-hmm. before. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. Yeah. God, I hope this doesn't happen again. It can't for this episode. No. I'm recording in like three different places right now just to make sure it doesn't. If it does and we have to recreate it, that's just the universe being like do over. Mm -hmm. Something went wrong. Yeah, not this week. (laughs) You said your plans about margaritas. Don't do it. Not this week. (laughs) So, um, sadly, you did not get to celebrate the way you should have, but you did release a book. I did. And we released our first audio book as part of the podcast audiobook production. Mm Mm-hmm arm of what we are doing right so that was very exciting it was exciting uh it seems to have worked yeah i don't think we've gotten any like angry email i haven't seen any unless Mm -mm. you fielded them and hid them from me no no i haven't seen any angry emails people are able to purchase it off of our online store right my okay mind blown yeah so my mom is is a very smart lady when it comes to very specific things but she's really not like tech savvy at all Mm -hmm. so she signed up for the patreon and I saw it come through and I was like, well, I'll call you and I'll, I'll walk you through how to do it. And she was like, I figured it out. I was like, OK, my mom can do it. <laughs> like everyone should be able to have no problem figuring Snaps. this out. Like mom didn't know what book funnel was or anything, like totally had no idea. Right. So but yeah, she was like, yeah, I downloaded it. Easy peasy. And I was like, OK, well, then that's it's got to be easy. Then. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that hopefully will just get easier and easier as more people just get on board with the book funnel and the Patreon and. We are we are already looking now towards mm-hmm. future what our future audiobooks will be. Yeah. Um and so we also in this last week while I was on vacation, uh we kind of went wide with mm-hmm. the program. We're like, let's post about it, let's tell people what we're doing. Yeah. Let's let people know this is an option. So I thought today we could talk about that section a little bit deeper, mm-hmm. go into more details. Yeah. Uh and also like talk about why we want to do this. So I think I'll start because it was sort of this crazy idea that I came to you with. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Not long ago. Like, it really we knew wasn't. we were going to start the podcast and we knew at some point audio production was going to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't until we were talking about doing Gardens and Ghosts that I was like, you know what? If you haven't already contracted with another company to do that, mm-hmm. what if we released it as part of the podcast? And yeah. then, like, I don't get paid up front like I do usually <laughs> yeah, from that yeah. other production house. Right. Um, but then we can just split the yeah. royalties, mm-hmm. which which is not even, they're not even royalties. They're just like the full sale price of the book. Yeah. So we're basically cutting out the the distribution, mm-hmm. the, just the person who gives it to other people because I can't talk today. The distribution channel. The distribution channel. The distribution channel. I totally have not had margaritas yet. Today. Yeah, I know. Um, I promise, guys. This yeah. is just us. No, nope, this is this is just me being very sneaky. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we we cut that part out, so it's just a direct sales kind of thing, and it kind of is something that we had talked before. We even were talking about podcast stuff. We were talking about trying to diversify and figuring out other ways of getting revenue, just because of being either freelance or part time like me. Mm-hmm. So this was just one of those harebrained schemes that like made sense with what we wanted to do and it aligned with us trying to do other things income wise so when when you pitched i was like this sounds cool and Mm -hmm. you know it's it's hard for me and we've talked about this before i I don't have any damn money so it's hard (laughs) for me to be able to like hire you at your rate so and uh yeah tantor is amazing but they hadn't reached out about gardens and ghosts yet so honestly i didn't think they wanted it which I was like, oh, because they have all the other ones. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Are you, why don't you want book five? Like, this is the finale, y'all. So I'm sure they have their 
their list their list of check marks that have to happen before they yeah. send the email. Yeah, for sure. So. Which I get. So I have, like they needed to make sure it made money and stuff. So mm-hmm. I'm like, that's fine. But yeah, they reached out like right after we were like, okay, we're going to do this. They reached out. So I got to be like, hi, I'm mm-hmm. doing something different. I appreciate you. Don't go away. Right. <laughs> like, we still love you. Yeah, and we still, still love you. <laughs> we're both happily promoting those first four books. Oh, for sure. Because we want them to get to the fifth book. Yeah. And then yeah. buy it from us. Yeah, right. Yeah. This is all part of the plan. Yeah. 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 So, so th- th- I mean, that's very exciting. Um, I think it's really important to find ways to make this sort of art accessible. Mm-hmm. I was just yep. listening on my lunch break to TJ Klune's interview with Overdrive on their podcast called mm-hmm. Professional Book Nerds. And they were talking about just the importance of audio and accessibility and that, you know, even if you're an independent self-published author, like you, you have to consider audio because it's such a huge part of the marketplace. Right. Um, uh, and like. Over the last 10 years, the share of U.S. adults who listen to audiobooks has grown by more than 100%. That's so that cool. means it's been more than double-digit growth every year yeah. for 10 years. That's so cool. They're not just something for people who have disabilities or uh, you know, have trouble reading. Mm-hmm. They're not just things that you listen to in the car anymore. They are like right. a part of our lives. They are a market. Yeah. A very popular part of the, the publishing market. Mm-hmm. But... The truth is it's not right for everybody. Yeah, no, it's it's a especially I think if you're an indie author, because you you see that you see that the market's growing. And in these, you know, big groups that I'm a part of people who are, you know, have who pull in a million dollars a year and cut stuff like that. They're like, you know, I make my investment back so fast and all this other stuff. But when you're tiny or you're way more niche or you're new it's almost impossible because mm-hmm. it's rightfully expensive to produce. So being able to be like, well, you know, I'm only selling a couple books a day, like yeah. or a, a week, a month, whatever. It's hard to justify taking out a loan for like X amount of money right. to do it, which is uh, honestly like some bigger, more established authors were saying that they're like, oh, just take out a loan and like make it work. And I'm like, Okay, that's not viable if, for if everyone. If you can though. guarantee that you're going to get the sales on the back yeah, end. And exactly. I, I do truly believe that like that investment pays out eventually. For sure. Um, most of the contracts through the independent audiobook producers where an author hires a narrator directly, mm-hmm. they're seven year contracts yep. about. Yeah. So I truly believe that over the course of seven years, the investment oh, yeah. that you make in the narrator, you'll pay that off and then some. Mm-hmm. So I do think it's a good investment, but it's about having that starting capital. Right. And I, I couldn't in good conscience ever go to someone and be like, take out a loan to hire me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, don't do that. No. <laughs> don't, yeah. Don't, I, I can't stand my own idea. I'm like, that. who needs more fuck, fucking debt? Like, mm-hmm. nobody needs that. No. So, um, because while I'm confident it will earn out, mm-hmm. it may take years. And in yeah. the meantime, you're paying on that capital and that interest. Yeah. So, what are ways that you can hire a narrator without paying them upfront? Well, one of them is royalty share, mm-hmm. uh, which is a great option, but any narrator worth their salt is going to ask you to prove that the book is going to earn some money for both of you. Right. And if like you're talking about the sales are like one or two a week, you're just getting started. You're still Mm -hmm. building your audience. It's not, that's not going to convince a narrator to come on board. And so the person you're going to get is somebody probably brand new Mm -hmm. who doesn't really know what they're doing, doesn't know their own worth. Mm -hmm. And then you're really rolling the dice on the quality of that audio book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because they're doing it for like the experience and the exposure. Mm -hmm. If you are hiring anybody for anything, I'm not talking just about audio, audio books, acting, every field imaginable. If somebody is willing to work for free for experience and exposure, run. Yeah, usually not a good thing. You do not want to be their guinea pig. Mm -hmm. You just don't. Yeah. Uh, If they are not willing to accept a reasonable fee because they're they just don't know if they'll be able to do a good enough job don't count on them yeah no it's it, everyone has to start somewhere so i'm like you know no shame to that but yeah you got to be careful with that mm-hmm. yeah so yeah so that is an option um but otherwise it's really like sell to a production house mm-hmm. where you get a bit of an advance up front mm-hmm. a great option for a lot of people uh royalties come out the back end or you pay up front to the narrator and you get the royalties mm-hmm but the thing to consider in all of those is that when you have that middleman, mm-hmm. which is usually ACX right. for Amazon, they get to determine the price of the book. Mm-hmm. They get to determine what their costs are. Mm-hmm. So the huge chunk that they take out is like, oh, this is just 
our cost. Right. And then they get to de- get to determine then what the profit is. Right. And then you split that profit with them 50-50. Yeah. And then sometimes that you're also then splitting the profit with your narrator. Mm-hmm. So typically, even if you do an exclusive deal with Amazon, the most you are getting from a sale of an audiobook is 20% of what Amazon decides the profit is. Yeah. So it's it's not a lot. Mm-mm. It's pennies on the dollar. Like it's nothing. You could so. be seeing like your book sold for like 23 bucks on Audible mm-hmm. and you're getting like a buck 75 mm-hmm. for every sale. And you're like, how is that possible? Yeah. I should be getting 20% of the cost of the, of the price of that book. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. You get 20% of what Amazon decides the profit is. Yeah. And then they send you that. So yeah. with that model, it can sometimes just take so long to get any sort of return on investment yeah. before you're making money. Mm-hmm. And not that any of those are bad ways to go. And like lots of people have gone that direction and it's worked out for them and they're very happy, mm-hmm. perfectly valid way, ways to do things. For sure. Another thing that I have seen some people doing is like crowdfunding for their audio. Mm-hmm. And they're doing it as individuals. They're going to their audience and they're saying, hey, will you pay basically up front mm-hmm. to eventually get an audiobook if enough people want it? Right. Like through Kickstarters or crowdfunding, stuff like that. Yeah. Another perfectly valid way to do things. Yeah. This was a unique idea, I think. I haven't seen anybody else doing that. We're like, we're already doing our own kind of crowdfunding mm-hmm. by having the Patreon. Right. We can offer an audiobook a month as a value prospect to those mm-hmm. people who are investing in us on Patreon already. Right. And the author gets me, an established, mm-hmm. experienced narrator. Yep. In the queer fiction realm. Yep. Uh, And those are all good things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, with especially being indie, being able to have, because this is just how the industry works. If your name's attached to it, I know I'll get sales. Because I I see that like in the like MM romance groups and stuff like that. They're like, oh, it's a Kurt Graves book. I'm just going to automatically download it because our genre behaves differently than most other genres. Like our, our audience has a, you know, attachment to their narrators. They have their favorites and they'll just, whatever you produce, they'll buy it. So that's awesome. So, yeah. And I, like, I know I'm not affordable for some people. Mm-hmm. I get that. But like, I have to make a living, so I can't oh, yeah. do things for free just because they're, just because right. they seem fun. Yeah. You right. know? So this is a nice way uh, to be able to give something back to the community, to be able to use the skill set that I have uh, to help people who otherwise might not be able to afford me. Mm-hmm. Um, but while still getting something out of it myself. Right. Like this is at the end of the day, a business arrangement. Anybody mm-hmm. we do this with has to know this is a business arrangement. Yeah. We are getting something out of this. Oh, for sure. Like yeah. well, this I mean, is not altruistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the deal that we are making mm-hmm. with authors or, or even small publishing companies mm-hmm. um, is that we will produce the audiobook. We will do everything. We will, no cost to them. Right. So I'll record it. We'll proof it. We'll edit it. We'll master it. We'll distribute it. Mm -hmm. Everything's on our end. The deal is for one year, it is exclusively available to our Patreon members and through our online store. Right. So they get nothing for one year. Yeah. But we are not distributing on Audible Mm -hmm. or Libro FM or Kobo or any of those other places. Right. So after one year, we give them their audio rights back and the recording. Mm -hmm. They now have an audio book that they can put into the wider marketplace. We are totally out of the equation. Right. They do with it what they want. Mm -hmm. They release it. They collect all the royalties. I I mean, I, and I, I, again, I recognize that I might be biased because I'm part of this, but Mm -hmm. like, I love that because like for me, with uh, I all of my books as of right now, other than Garden of the Ghosts, is through Tantor. So mm-hmm. I got my advance, and then I get t- I think twenty percent for the next like five years. So mm-hmm. that's just how much I'm going to make on those audiobooks for five years. If I was able to get Smash and Grabs audiobook rights back and make a hundred percent, I'd be doing way better. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? But it is what it is. I couldn't afford to do something else at the time. It wasn't available. Whatever. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I I don't know. I just think it's a cool way for little smaller audience people to be able to 
have that in their back pocket and make money off of it later. I sure hope so. And yeah, that's the plan. We we put it out into the world mm-hmm. this weekend and yeah. we've already had like a dozen submissions. Yeah, I was very happy awesome. about that. I was so worried that we were just off the mark on this. And yeah, like, well, I mean, we were going to be like, we're putting out one audiobook a month and then like nobody would want us to do that. Yeah. yeah. And we'd have to go like pay to buy some audio rights from people mm. and be like, can we please produce your book? We have to give our Patreon subscribers something once a month. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the time knowing logically that like, no, there are authors out there who are doing good work mm-hmm. who just can't afford the audiobook portion. Right. Because again, it's an investment. Yeah. Totally understand that. It's not the right thing to do. For a lot of people, mm-hmm. there are much better ways to spend your money to become better authors and produce better products than mm-hmm. putting money into audiobooks. Yeah. And I encourage people to do that. Yeah. Spend money on that before yeah. spending money on an audiobook. Yeah. Bettering your craft is always yes. like top. That importance. will pay dividends mm-hmm. over time much more than having your audiobook yeah. produced. Um, so, like, I know that those authors are out there. They've written great stories. They just haven't found the audience yet to be able to afford audio and so thankfully even though like my little devil on my shoulder was like nobody will want you to do this <laughs> the logical part of my brain was right mm-hmm. those people exist yeah they're out there yeah no i was i was thrilled when we actually got some submission because i was the same way i was like i i really feel like this is a good idea but it's also like not an echo chamber, but like, we're just talking to ourselves. And of course, Alex is always supportive. So he's like, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, he doesn't know the market. He doesn't know if we're doing the right thing that aligns with what people are going to want and the demand and stuff. So when we actually saw some submissions, which we went through them, they're cool as hell. Like these stories are interesting. So reading through, I'm like, this is neat. These Mm -hmm. are like really interesting stories that we have a chance to. Variety. Yeah. It's not like, just one type of author Mm -hmm. or one genre is coming forward. Like we're seeing lots of different, different flavors, you know, Uh, which is, I mean, that's one thing we would like to do for our Patreon subscribers is like offer some different flavors. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, I will say that like, we are somewhat limited in that. Like it has to be a book that's appropriate for me as like a cisgendered white man Mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. You know, that's that's fair. So there is there are still some limitations in that realm, mm-hmm. uh, which is a bummer. But again, you know, if we get to the point where we have a lot of subscribers and we're earning enough that we can pay a narrator to do a book, yeah, then those options open up. So yeah. it is for people who are thinking, oh my gosh, maybe I can submit. Uh, the one thing I would keep in the back of your mind is like it has to be something that for now. I can do. Yeah. Because right now I am the narrator you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you so, don't like me, don't, sub- don't submit. Yeah. Cause it's going to be me. Yeah. Well, I think we've been pretty upfront about that. Like we're, we are not keeping somebody in our back no, no, pocket. No. So <laughs> we're, yeah, we're in, this is yeah. yeah. like Justin Timberlake said, it's going to be me. So oh just, just be prepared. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we have so many good options already, mm-hmm. and we hope to continue to get submissions from yeah. people um, that we already know we're going to need some help determining what the next one should be. Mm-hmm. Like, wh- who wants this the most? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so to that end, we are going to open up some polling options. And we actually found out today, today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that um, uh, Patreon now lets uh, people subscribe to us for free. So mm-hmm. if you aren't in a place to where you can commit to either the five or ten dollar level you can just join us for free and be able to interact with polling questions and posts and stuff mm-hmm. um so we're going to create a poll for our top whatever i don't right. think we've decided how no, many well, are in there yet well, we will narrow the field well yeah and then we want to hear from yeah from, from y'all. subscribers mm-hmm. what are you most interested in yeah so and you'll you can steer us in the right direction and then we'll pick based mm-hmm. on that so right. It's pretty exciting. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say that right up front. Okay. If something wins the poll, doesn't necessarily mean that's the thing that's happening. You're such a brat. <laughs> well, this is for guidance, not final decision making. That's fair. That's fair. I, I imagine most of the time the poll winner will be the thing that we do next. But like, right. as the person who has to sit in that box and read the book out loud. Yeah. If, I, if you're not vibing with it. <laughs> I, I am the RuPaul of this situation. That's fair. I have the final say. Of who stays and who sashays away. 
Okay. So okay. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, if you can't like get in the headspace, I get it. I get right. it. So right. So um, I would imagine that by next week we'll we'll be announcing what our October audiobook will be. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. Yes. So uh, so you have that to look forward to. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I'm not ready to subscribe at the five or ten dollar level, please go subscribe now as one of our free Patreon members. Mm-hmm. Just be a part of it. Join the conversations. See the public facing posts that we do there and participate in these polls uh, once the time comes. And, and yeah. that time is coming. It's coming very soon. Yeah, we're in the process of building it. So it is happening. Yes, yes. So that's what's going on with the audiobook production side of of Hoof and Fang. Mm-hmm. Very excited about it. Very excited to see that there's interest. Yes. Um, if you know of someone who should be taking advantage of this, who should be applying, Send them to us. Mm-hmm. Um, they can check out all the details at hoofandfangpodcast.com forward slash audio. Yep. All the details are there. All the pros and cons of doing it our way versus other ways. We are not trying to sell people on something uh, and then like pull the rug out from under them later. Like right. We're very upfront with what the pros are. Um, and the, the one major con is that we get your book yeah, for one year. For one year, it is ours. Right. It's exclusively ours. But mm-hmm. after that, it's it's 100% yours. Right. Like, we're not so going to touch it again. You pay nothing mm-hmm. and you get nothing for one year. Yeah. <laughs> after one year, you get it all. Yeah. You get a full audiobook. You get a full, fully produced audiobook that mm-hmm. you can put into the larger audiobook marketplace. Yeah. It will not have been there before. Yeah. So that's a totally different audience. Totally different audience. So, so. yeah. So that, uh, that hopefully continues to be like really exciting and we keep getting submissions and mm-hmm. and hopefully people love the audiobooks that we're producing. And yeah. This turns into an amazing opportunity for both of us forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Um, speaking of reading books, though, mm-hmm. I got some feedback about the podcast yeah. a few weeks ago uh, and they were like, oh, you should talk about like what you're reading. I <laughs> love and hate that question. And I was like, well, we'll think about it mm-hmm. um, because it is a good suggestion. Yeah. And one would think we work in books. Certainly yeah. we're. It's all we do. We're okay. reading all the time. Yeah. But this is also a question that authors and narrators hate. Yeah. Well, because it's technically we are reading all the time. But like for me, I'm reading my own shit constantly. Mm. So what am I reading? stupid dinosaur short story that i hate right now <laughs> like that's what i'm reading right so and like what are you reading right now the books that i'm prepping that i have to record within yeah. the next few weeks like yeah the yeah. thing you're being paid to do mm-hmm. right. so and it's not that we don't sometimes get to enjoy other things those sure. times are just fewer and far between and certainly like we do not have the lifestyle of like the the readers that we know mm-hmm. who will sit down after work and read a whole book for yeah. the night yeah. Like that's their entertainment for the night. I just can't. Like I can't after a full day of recording mm-hmm. go home and read for fun. Yeah. No, that's <gasps> just yeah, I would imagine especially for you like it's you just did that for x amount mm-hmm. of hours you were reading something. Like yeah. your brain probably just rejects it like shuts it does. down. Yeah. It does. So I am actually like I just took a trip and so I had the chance to pick up a, a physical book. Mm-hmm. Um didn't like it. Left it at the cabin. Yeah. Because I was like, I'm not going to finish this. I'll leave it for whoever might want to Mm -hmm. enjoy it in the future. Sounded interesting. Wasn't for me. It's okay to not finish a book. Yes. It is 100% okay. Yeah. And in the meantime, I was listening to an audiobook that I finished. Started a new one. It's a Mm -hmm. memoir. Molly Shannon's memoir. Nice. Which, you know, that was the entertainment I needed yesterday as I was driving eight hours from Minnesota back home. That's a long drive. That was great. Yeah. So like there are times when we get to really enjoy the things we do. Mm-hmm. I often find myself picking out celebrity memoirs for entertainment yeah. reading uh, because it is so different from what I do. Yeah. And it's one of the few times that I can turn my subjective brain off mm-hmm. because even when I'm listening to like female narrators, um, sometimes I'm like, oh, I would have done this differently. That's fair. So yeah. like it's, it, you're critiquing what? somebody else has done because it's what you do yeah it is what you do for a job <laughs> yeah I, I do that too i mean it, it, i try not to be that person but it if a book could really just i get tunneled into it i'm not thinking that way but it's really hard for me to initially 
get to that point. Mm-hmm. So I'll usually I'm reading it and I'm like, man, that sounds amazing. I want to steal that. Mm-hmm. Or like, I love how they, how their prose is. So like I start like almost beating myself up. Cause I'm like, this sounds amazing. Why don't I sound right. like this? You know what I mean? Right. Um, so that's, I'm usually the opposite where I'm like, I'm, I'm a hack. <laughs> start right. reading something really good. And I just start ripping into myself. Um, but also that's how you become better as a writer is if you, you have to read a lot. Mm-hmm. So it makes it, it's, it's like an, a cycle of me never having time to read, only reading my own crap. When I do read other things, it's amazing. And mm. I hate myself. And then I start over again. Right. So yeah, fun. So, so that's why we hate that question. <laughs> yeah. If you ever meet an author or a narrator, come up with something else to ask. Them. Yeah. Don't, don't, because I'm going to be like, <laughs> I'm reading my draft. We will, we will only disappoint you mm-hmm. with our answer. Yeah. Uh, because most of the time we are not really reading or listening for fun. No. And, and what little time I did have for reading for fun, um, I have now taken up with reading books for this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Because I was like, you know what would be fun? Let's do recaps of a 20-year-old middle grade mm-hmm. fantasy series. Yeah, that was my evening a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Like, I finally got some free time and I just knocked out an Animorphs book. See, it like, can be done. Yeah, it I just can be done. sat down and just knocked it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're also really good books and so mm-hmm. I enjoy them. But yeah, it was... Yeah, that was, that's what I did. <laughs> so what are Animorphs. we reading? Animorphs. Animorphs. That's what we're reading right that's, now. That's and if you want to know what we think about that, mm-hmm. you have to subscribe to the Patreon at, yep. at least the $5 level. Yes. So that you can get our weekly episodes as we go through that entire series. Mm-hmm. So, all right, now that we've plugged Patreon in like 20 different ways, <laughs> should we should we go to our guest interview? Yeah, I think this is, this is a good time to do yeah, that. We had a really good time uh, chatting with Nicole Knight. Uh, Nicole is the author of the Fire and Brimstone series, which I narrated for her. Um, and we talk about that a lot in the interview. Uh, Nicole is a born and bred Hoosier living in a top secret location in Europe. Mm. I happen to know what it is. But I'm not saying. You're so special. Because it's top secret. (laughs) Uh, They are a single mother to two wonderful gremlins, um, uh, by which I think they mean their actual kids, because then they specify, and their golden retriever, Stratus. (laughs) Also, notice the golden retriever gets named in their bio. Not the gremlins. Not the kids. Nope. Uh, And they write love in all its forms. Uh, This is our interview with Nicole Knight. Welcome to the podcast, author Nicole Knight. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We're so happy you're here. Thank you for making the time. Of course. You are in a part of the world where it is much later. So thank you for staying up late if this is in fact late for you. I mean, it's 10 o'clock. So normally I'd be in my pajamas and I had to kind of, you know, doll myself up a bit. Oh, you could have been in pajamas. I basically record (laughs) in pajamas. Yeah, I was about to say I'm wearing like pajama pants under this i just mm-hmm. i was slightly yeah. professional <laughs> i was tempted i was tempted yeah. to come on in my jammies but i was like eh, you know yeah got an image so, up old, right <laughs> yeah exactly right. so since this is our first time getting to chat with you we want to go all the way back to the beginning and find out how you started writing well um yeah i started writing about the time that i moved from the states to the netherlands which is where i live now And when I first moved here, I didn't know the language and I had a lot of time on my hands. So that was kind of the beginning of me writing as like a hobby. And yeah, that was seven years ago. And at first I was just kind of writing and publishing stuff on Wattpad, which is I'm pretty sure most people know what Wattpad is, um, where yeah, people can read your stories for free and stuff. And I gained a bit of a following and yeah, then I decided to publish for real. So. Is that when you came up with your pseudonym? Um, yes. The not immediately. Once I decided that I was probably going to publish in like publishing something that isn't Wattpad, that's when I was like, yeah, I think I then need to think of a pseudonym. So yeah. that came a little bit after. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, uh, I have narrated your Fire and Brimstone series. Yes, you have. Which was six books originally. Uh-huh. And then there's now been, what would, what would you call that? Part um, of the extended I it, universe? I call it a spinoff story. <laughs> spinoff so, story. A spinoff story within the same universe. <laughs> okay. So seven yeah. books so far. Yeah. And after narrating seven books, I must ask, okay. who hurt you? <laughs> 
Oh Just yeah. Out the swinging, are you? Why are you like this? <laughs> I mean, I'd say sorry, but some people like to read books that hurt them. So I feel like I can't honestly say sorry. <laughs> okay, so don't apologize. But see, but but how like how did you find that? Like, is that instinctual for you that you've always written something that really like? I can't even say tugs at the heartstrings. Like, just squeezes the heart, <laughs> like rips it out of the chest, stomps it on the ground, and then like hands it back a mangled piece of like bacon and says, Aww. "Here you go." And then we go, "Thank you." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll take it. And then you thank me for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a couple chapters later, we do it again. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, oh, man, I don't. I don't know. Um, when I first started writing, the biggest thing that I, at least what, it, what I enjoyed writing, was what I like to read. And I mean, people love all sorts of different books. And I like the ones that are a little more darker, a little like what you said, tugs on the heartstring or obliterates it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So... Oh yeah, yeah, that, heart, that string of... has been pu pulled out. <laughs> it's not a tug. It's like when you start a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah kind of a yeah. harsh yank. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I guess those are the kind of books that I like to read. And so that's kind of where I went with it. And it was, yeah, Fire and Brimstone is the first series that I self-published. So I was. it was also a bit of a learning curve kind of going through that process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, who hurt me? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd probably say, oh, religion, you know. Sure. Growing up super conservative didn't really help, so. <laughs> no, it probably didn't. And actually, that probably formed a large basis for the world you create in Fire yes. and Brimstone. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, what? you can tell I was working through some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, maybe that's why I relate to it so much, because I've gone through that, yeah. you know, religious upbringing. And I was a youth I was a Catholic youth minister for six years. And then, oh, like, wow. okay. you know, eventually came to my senses. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, got yeah. deprogrammed. <laughs> so yeah. uh, yep. walked away from it. But, like, I definitely understand the how to say like i don't know like putting a lot of stock in in things that might happen after the fact instead of uh -huh. worrying about like what's happening right in front of me yeah so but uh but yeah i was raised super conservative in like the midwest um and christianity was essentially like my identity for the majority of my life and yeah i feel like with fire and brimstone specifically there was a lot of kind of me working through the things that I was starting to believe to be true about myself and about the world compared to this ideology that had essentially been the basis of who I was for like, I don't know, 28, 29 years. And then, um, yeah, I no longer identify as a Christian and I've kind of left that behind me. But Fire and Brimstone was definitely a kind of delving into into some of those things for myself in a subconscious way. <laughs> right. Well, and for those who don't know, like what's your what's your pitch on fire and brimstone? Like what how do you how do you describe that in like a short form? Oh man. See, writing blurbs are i I'm so bad at it. I always hate it when people ask me what your books are about. It's always mm -hmm. harder to They're describe. Evil. Yeah. That, see, okay. Like, doing an elevator pitch for like yes. an entire like months and months of work. I'm like, I don't don't have time for yeah. me to be able to like squish this down into like two sentences. But exactly. you know, do that for our podcast, please. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, Fire Brimstone. Um it's about found family. It's about healing from trauma, obviously. Um <laughs> it's about discovering truth about yourself. And yeah, it essentially follows Riley, my main character, and he comes from a religiously abusive background. And um, yeah, it's a lot more about him and his personal growth than maybe the over the overarching plot of the war between heaven and hell, which he is stuck between. Um, I think it focuses a lot more on him and his 
personal growth and the growth within his chosen family of his guardian angels. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a ride and <laughs> it's a roller coaster. <laughs> but if you, as Kurt said, if you like books that will obliterate your heart, Fire mm-hmm. Brimstone, it's a good choice. <laughs> right. Well, and as a marketing tactic, it's it's really smart to say like they they're gonna get to a resolution but you have to buy all six books yes yes that's true Mm -hmm. um only one book ends in a cliffhanger the rest of them don't really end in cliffhangers but the happily ever after is hard fought and hard won but it Mm -hmm. is there in the end they get there yes just take six books it just takes six books no big deal no. Hey, man. Look. There's a box set. Just yeah. go get it. Exactly. You know? I was about to say, it's it's all packaged <laughs> so nicely now. Like, you can just get everything and just binge through it and, and exactly. cry and enjoy it. <laughs> and you will cry. Um, I've actually talked about you on this podcast in another interview that, like, my meme for you would be, like, it'd be you behind your computer, like, I'm going to space these out just enough so that Kurt cries once a day. <laughs> yeah, it, that was purposeful, didn't you know? Mm-hmm. I, I planned well, the entire the entire six-book series around you, so. She yeah. just pulls a sticky note, and she's like, cry once a day. Now. Right. Yeah. I, I didn't, I, it didn't necessarily have to be me, but clearly. <laughs> she had your you, <laughs> you had your pacing all yeah. set out. <laughs> like, all right. I guess. Um, I'm going to hit these beats where he's crying. <laughs> yeah, I never really set out to be like, I'm going to write books that make people cry. But now that that's kind of become my MO, I'm just going to lean into it. And I'm like, you know sure. what? I'm okay with that. It's your brand. <laughs> it's your brand. You're good at it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So as much as we tease, the books are very good. No, thank you. Like you don't, you don't end up crying if you don't and if you're not connected to the story that's being yeah. told mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and sometimes you know as we talk about all these stories that are in the world of sci-fi and fantasy having characters that still feel grounded enough and real but- enough to like connect to in that way and have that like visceral emotional response like that can be a challenge mm-hmm. so how do you approach that as a writer yep. like creating this fantastic world but making sure the people in it aren't unrelatable. Oh, man. Um, I mean, maybe this is like a cop out, but I honestly follow my characters a lot. I plot a little bit. (laughs) I know like generally the things that will happen in the book, but how we get there, a lot of times I'll kind of, as I'm writing, I'll follow where the characters lead me. And I feel like that's kind of important when you're building realistic characters is even if I want something to happen or I want a specific conversation to happen between my characters, if I try to force it and it doesn't feel natural, then the scene isn't going to work. And so then I would change it and I would try a different approach. And sometimes the conversation would change completely. But I'm like, well, but that sounds like the character. So I'm going to go that direction with it. Um. And yeah, sometimes I wrote from maybe not personal experience, because obviously I've never met a guardian angel. But I mean, the human experience is something we all share. So taking those emotions and transferring it just maybe to fit a different type of situation that happens in this magical, fantastical world, everyone can still relate to that, even if, you know, they don't believe in heaven and hell or guardian angels. Mm. Yeah, that's something that I, I talk to my my partner about because he writes as well. Um, oh. He's very, very structured in like his outlines, but I'm kind of like how you are where I'll like, I have the major backbone, but the, like <laughs> all the meat and gooiness, like I fill in as I go. So I tell mm-hmm. him that I thrive in the wiggle room. Like I have to yes. give myself space to like feel out what that situation calls for, because mm-hmm. it, at least for me, and I, I think for you too, like you keep it too structured, then they turn out to be robots or they don't feel genuine or it just feels bad. I don't know. Like it, yeah. it reads wrong too. Like it just hits uh-huh. the eye or ear wrong. So Yeah. Yep. I so agree. do you guys ever find yourself in trouble then? Like 
Oh, constantly. Well, I found my I followed my character, <laughs> and now I don't know what the fuck to do. Oh yeah, like if you ever get a chance to talk to Jess, she's probably got a whole fucking folder just being like, I don't know what's wrong with her. Like why why are they on like in space now? Not not that bad, but, you know. Like just <laughs> yeah, I do constantly get myself in sticky ass situations, and I have to figure out either like walk it all the way back and rewrite it, or try to like pull a rabbit out of my hat and make it work. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's definitely when I hear people who really do a lot of plotting and they're like, yeah, you know, it keeps them on time and they're able to write consistently, you know, and meet their word goals and all that stuff. I'm like, man, that must be nice because I've tried. <laughs> <We're kindred> spirits. <laughs> yeah. I remember what book was it? I can't remember which book it was specifically, but I like plotted it out more so than I'd ever plotted a book before. And guess what? I did not follow that plot one bit. I got like... <laughs> halfway in and I was like no this isn't working anymore and the book took a completely different turn and I'm like okay I guess that's just my process that I have to accept that about myself so (laughs) I think that's part of the journey though is like kind of figuring out like where your problem areas are and just Mm -hmm. trying to anticipate it but it never works I mean we get better I think with time but I think we're always just gonna be a little nuts like with our how the story comes together yep and as long as the story comes together, that's the important part, right? Hey, right? Like, that's all that matters is that it, we, yeah. we can at least say the end on something and then exactly. fix it as we go. So, And if we're lucky, maybe there will be some stuff in the story that people point out and be like, whoa, you must have thought that through. And I'm like, yeah, I totally did. No, yeah, that was just sure did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you got to trust your gut, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go with instincts. I mean, yeah. I, I think there are definitely people who are more, uh, and I, I think, you know, the the parallel to what you guys are talking about in the narration world is, like, there are people who, like, seriously prep. Like, they take the book, and they highlight every person who speaks in a different color, and they're writing wow. down notes all over their script, and, like, they prep. Yeah. Like, they, like, there is no wiggle room because their whole creative process has taken place before they even get in the booth. Uh-huh. Um, and then there are people like me who are like, fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I haven't I haven't put an actual note on a script in a long time because I, wow. I want the I want the experience of, of going into the booth and letting some of that instinctual stuff happen. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes even being surprised by what what comes out. Well, and so. I think that that helps with the relatability that you were talking about. If it's coming naturally, if it's happening naturally, people relate to that more than if you try to like force a situation on characters that maybe would never be in that situation for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And then people are like, they don't feel connected to it because you can tell, oh, this was contrived purely for plot or whatnot. And right. that can be the same with the narration. Yeah, going with what and it also natural. like it it can change based on your mood. Mm-hmm. You know, like when you prep, and this is the, always the thing I think about people who prep a lot is like, what if you're in a different place mentally than you were when you prepped that book? Oh yeah, because sometimes you can read a book for the first time and have a very different experience than when you sit down to actually record it. Mm-hmm. And like neither one is more right or more wrong, but I'm just like, how do you reach for a thing that you thought about? previously rather than just like living in the moment and how you feel right now and like how it's hitting you in this second yeah yeah you know like so much of an audiobook is based on just pure chance because it's like this happened to be the day i sat down to record this book yeah and how my brain and heart were functioning today and so this is the product you're getting <laughs> you know could i recreate it some other day maybe not you know because mm-hmm. that's just there is, is as much as it's being put down on I don't know I was going to say paper but like a word processing uh, <laughs> document <laughs> paper paper, paper yeah. yeah put on, on paper or recorded you know on a computer yeah. uh, like and it will live forever like part of the creative process is that like anything could happen at any mm-hmm. given moment and mm-hmm. you never know yeah it's true yeah I mean that's there's a book that I'm writing uh, that I've been writing off and on for like two years now. And when I first started it, I was in a completely different place than I am now. And so when I went back to kind of read through what I'd written and, you know, oh, do I feel like a, do I feel like working on this book again? 
I was like, oh, this book is going to go someplace different now because I'm in a different place. Like I was I'm not there anymore. And so now there's like a whole different it's still going to be a similar story. But like there's a different path that I'm going to be taking to get to the ending now because I'm in this new different place. And that's I don't know. That's what's great about creativity. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and that's why when you have those people who just like they're so struggling because they're like, oh, there are no new ideas. It's like, okay, fine. No, there aren't. No new ideas. Mm. But, like, you can approach the story your own way. Mm -hmm. And, like, what we've just been talking about is, like, even you as an individual could be telling a a story a different way just by approaching it at different times in your life. So, like, Mm -hmm. just bring yourself to your work if you work in a creative field and, like, in a a way, see what happens. Yeah, definitely. I can get behind that. Well, and I, I, there's a saying too that I I don't remember where I heard it, what what they were talking about, like, especially with readers, like people saying that these ideas have been done to death or like this trope's been done to death. I'm like, if you show up at a buffet and there's like a whole line of cakes, you're not like, ew, look at all these cakes. You're just like, hell yeah, look at all these cakes. So it's like, even if it's something you've heard before, this cake is not going to be made the same by this person. And if it's the same flavor, because they're going to be adding their own little spin to it. Well, and I think yeah. that's what makes a good writer is you can take a trope that has been done before and yet still bring something new to it. Do you have favorite tropes? Um, well, hurt comfort, obviously. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> no even way. have to ask. <laughs> the theme of this episode. <laughs> yeah, I definitely like some hurt comfort. I do I do tend to like romance in my books. Um so There always has to be at least a little bit, even if maybe the main point is the plot or like a high fantasy. I do Mm -hmm. like it if there's at least a little bit of romance running through it. And yeah, it's honestly, I'm such a mood reader. I'm also a mood mood writer and I'm a mood reader. So sometimes I'm in the mood for something kind of funny, like a rom-com with enemies to lovers. And then other times I'm like, no, I want to like have my heart ripped out. So give me some hurt comfort with childhood best friends and second chance at love or whatnot. You know, now that you bring that up, I'm interested to know how much work you had to do to convince people to read Fire and Brimstone at the start, knowing that you weren't giving them a happily ever after right away. Like, um, how do you approach that from a from a marketing standpoint of like, hey, I've written this thing. Trust me. Yeah, I would it's, imagine that's difficult in romance because yeah. it's, it's expected and like if you, you to get that happily ever after or some type mm-hmm. of even at least happy or happy for now kind of thing so and if you don't give them that i mean readers will rip you apart for it mm-hmm. but it seems that a lot of people were super cool with it because like it's it's beloved so i i guess um honestly i don't know i i definitely marketed it as a slow burn so i did want to make sure i stressed that part that it was a slow burn romance because i knew especially like in book one there's almost no romance to it at all it's just setting like setting the stage if you will Mm -hmm. um and so i knew i couldn't call the book itself a romance that's why i was like well fire and brimstone as a series is going to be a romance so Mm -hmm. you know stay tuned for that (laughs) yeah so i bet the seeds were planted (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. it was enough to so people knew where the story would be going with it but yeah obviously in book one and even in book two there's not a lot of romance to it Mm -mm. but you know it's coming so yeah that was definitely the big thing i stressed was the slow burn aspect and maybe that worked i think i mean i think if you let people know it's slow burn because i i personally love like a really good drawn out slow burn like if you me too make me wait like three books before they even kiss by the time that happens i'm just like freaking out excited about it so there's definitely those like if you're in the mood for a good slow burn Uh that's awesome boy have i got a series for you (laughs) no way (laughs) (laughs) so but yeah i I think if if you are a slow burn reader like that's the payoff of when they finally Uh do get there is just so rewarding i love that yes yeah and a lot of it is just about finding the reader's that like you know there's always going to be readers that don't like me that don't like the way I write that don't like how I approach storytelling and that's totally fine and valid so it's like I'm going to write what I like and hopefully there's going to be other people out there that resonate with it and yeah I mean I'm so fortunate and I'm so grateful that there are people out there that resonated with the story I was actually blown away with the reactions people had especially to fire and brimstone I was yeah 
it's such a great feeling to know that there's people out there that enjoy the crazy stories in my head. Like it's nuts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and what's interesting about Fire and Brimstone specifically, because it's what I'm experienced with, I don't know that I've ever read another series that was this much of a slow burn. Um, but, like, the romance starts not with, like, romantic love, uh-huh. but, like, friendship uh-huh. and trust. Yeah. Love. Uh-huh. Then it gets romantic. Like, yeah. it goes through all those phases. And it's like, isn't that actually, like, a much more realistic reflection? <laughs> like, isn't that more of a reflection of, like, what happens in real life? Mm-hmm than yeah. we usually get in like romance tropes uh-huh. you know, not when again no no tea no shade nothing wrong with any oh, course, trope yeah. or style of story writing um but like i think for people who love romance like that's why i would stick with fire and brimstone even though like we didn't get to sexy times until like book four yeah you know (laughs) because like it's like oh you see you see what's happening Mm -hmm. like the relationships are forming Mm -hmm. yes um it's just not immediately like wedding bells are ringing Mm -hmm. type of connection it's like again first just like a a friendship then there's trust then there's love then you start thinking about them with their pants off yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and a lot of that came from Riley's background because he he came from an abusive background it just it didn't make sense for him again I follow my character's leads it wouldn't have made sense for things to have progressed faster or I don't know yeah I think it just made it made sense for his story for it to be a slow build and I think that's also a reflection in how I operate personally like that's that's how I grow in my in relationships that I have is I'm a slow burn so (laughs) it Mm, made sense (laughs) um let's talk a little bit more about like the fantasy elements of of this again we don't only have to talk about fire and brimstone but clearly it is the thing I know the most about (laughs) as I have spent a lot of time with it um you know so like you you have this grounded approach to like telling the story, but like, what's the influence for making it a story about angels and demons and heaven and hell and magic and huh. teleporting and yeah. Hebrew? Yes. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> oh yeah, I did. I put you through the ringer with having to speak Hebrew. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we obviously talked earlier about how I come from a religious background, so. Um, yeah, some of what I wrote came from actual like Christian theology and like things that are either said or hinted at in the Bible, um, things that I grew up with and like were very familiar to me. Obviously, it's a different take on religion because not only is there queerness, which Christianity tends to poo poo on, um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's this imperfection that I wanted to bring to these, like the idea of angels is that they're these holy, perfect beings, right? But people can't relate to that, like, because no one's perfect. And so I wanted to also, like, contrast that with just these deep, flawed characters that should maybe be holy, but they're just not. But the actual idea that this was born from uh, was twofold. Before I started Fire and Brimstone, I had been reading um, some MF romance that was uh, Reverse Harem. And at the time, I did not know of any queer harems. And so I was like, huh, I don't know if anyone's written that. I should write it. So even though there are definitely, I'm not the person, I'm never, ever going to say that I came up with it because I didn't. There were a lot of other queer harems that existed before Fire and Brimstone came along. I just didn't know it. Um, so that was one reason why I wanted to write kind of like this found family polyamorous story. And then the other one, how kind of the angels came about was it started with Jai and Noel and how, you know, there's the story of how you have an angel and a demon on your shoulder. And that's how it kind of started was you, I had my main character, Riley, and he had an angel and a devil that was helping him navigate his life. Obviously, Noel's the angel, Jai's the devil, clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, that obviously expanded once I started actually writing. I obviously had 
it more fleshed out with them both being guardian angels, part of this guardian team. Um, so that was super fun to like take something like Christianity, like religion, that not only was kind of critical to my identity at the time, but that I was struggling with because I had all of these new understandings and truths about myself and about the world that didn't seem to correlate with what Christianity says is right. So I had that struggle going on, but I was able to like take what I knew from Christianity and take things that like I researched and then create something new and fun and yeah, weaving that in with things that were real or yeah, I don't know. I don't want to like put people off by saying religion's not real, but you know what I mean. Things that well, are- but it's it, actually as you're <laughs> as you're talking, I'm realizing that like, yeah, so many of the stories that are told in the Christian faith and in lots of faith stories are mm-hmm. somewhat supernatural. Yeah. So like, it's not a stretch to go from the stories you're told as a kid in religious environments to a supernatural story about heaven and hell and angels and powers uh-huh. and. Yeah, because that's kind like that's what's in the Bible. The Bible is a supernatural story. Yes, and like the different classifications of angels that came from, like actual Christian theology, Mm -hmm. the names of the seven. I I like researched that that they also are stemmed from different names of demons that represented the seven deadly sins. Like it all kind of has like a basis in that. Yeah, again, realness quote unquote right but something that kind of stems from research or theology that's been done but then putting my own twist on it to be like this is how maybe i think it could go or should go or whatnot (laughs) right well and maybe two thousand years from now somebody will be fire and brimstone will be a sacred text and people will be like once upon a time (laughs) (laughs) there was savior riley was (laughs) you know (laughs) you know yeah, like, you never know. Really, it's just storytelling. It's mm-hmm. just good storytelling that it someone is. maybe takes a little too seriously. Yes. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so yeah, it's it is. It's just interesting to think about that leap not being really as far as I yeah. thought, even when I was first asking the question, like mm-hmm. why fantasy? Um, because that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Because, I mean, growing up in it, you're taught like this is truth, right? And then you get a little older and maybe think a little more critically about it. And you're like, oh, walking on Jesus walking on water. That's not natural. Like, that's magical. That's fantastical. And again, when you're taught that, oh, no, that's just like true. Take it at face value. You don't really see the fan, the, the fantastical in it. Mm-hmm. But really, it's like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in a lot of different religious beliefs. I know I'm picking on Christianity because... You know, that's where I'm at right now. But <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of that in a lot of religious beliefs, these fantastical ideas. Well, and like I I wasn't raised super religious. Like okay. my dad was like a holiday Catholic. Like mm. I, I think I've been to church, like real actual church, like maybe three times in my life. Oh, wow. So, yeah. yeah, it just wasn't like our mm-hmm. life. Like I spent more time with like my friend in synagogue when she was getting ready for her um, bat mitzvah. But oh, OK, OK. Right. But mm-hmm. like if. I think the first time that I looked into Christian, I'm going to say mythology with like, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Well, like, of course. But like if you look at like, if you go into it, reading it, like how I would approach reading Greek mythology, there's some really cool stories in there. Like the whole demon hierarchy and like their symbols and like classifications of angels and stuff. It's deeply interesting. And like, I didn't have a connection of ever thinking this stuff was real. I went into it thinking like, Oh, this is cool. Like, this mm-hmm. is just really cool, like, supernatural stuff. And they're made of eyeballs and flaming bushes. And it's just, it's cool. <laughs> so, like, I I can appreciate you taking that research and, like, really ballooning it out. Because there's a lot of really good stuff in there that you can make, like, these amazing stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's but- crazy that, like, a lot of this stuff is taught as, like, no, no, angels are real and they're made of eyeballs and you have to believe that. I'm like, oh, God. So, but, yeah. You yeah. know what's funny is like as you're talking, I'm realizing that like one of my favorite authors when I was growing up was Madeline Langle, 
who played with a lot of these th same themes. Mm -hmm. Are either of you familiar okay. with her work? No, I'm not. Oh, yeah, like very much so. I mean, Wrinkle in Time is her most famous book, but she had oh, uh, okay. like an, she had other series. Um, and in one of them, like two brothers get like sent back to the time of Noah. And like oh. she examines all of like the weird things that they talked about in the Bible that were happening at the time of Noah. Oh, like, including like having like giants and mm -hmm. Nephilim and eyeballs with wings and all of like it was <laughs> yeah. just it, and I, I'm like remembering. I was like, oh yeah, like and I so connected to her as a writer and and she was a bit of a Christian theologian as well and yet played in that fantasy space. Mm -hmm. And I was so attracted to that as a young person. So weird parallels are happening yeah. in my brain <laughs> there was no gay sex in uh, those well, bummer. oh do you have to think about it <laughs> actually there may have been a little bit of gay sex now that i think about it what do you just, tell yeah, just from a christian I, well, I theologian couldn't, i could not i could not come up with the specific well you know theologian it doesn't always mean like strictly adheres to those yeah, beliefs but like is interested in and can mm -hmm. speak to biblical themes and mm -hmm. you know what that what they might mean uh for our lives yeah that's I actually fair. i like i like her interpretation of the bible a lot more than most religions so and she did write about it quite a bit so huh. put that on the reading list yeah. yeah oh she yeah she's fantastic i'll uh when we put this out in the world i will have to look up the series that i'm thinking of and specifically the book because Okay. Now I've said some weird things that I want to confirm are true. I was about to say, I'm going to have to read it and be like, he said there's gay sex. Yes. I, I'm not. It's I'm not there. I'm not it's positive. Not okay. it, I'm not positive, but like it, <laughs> they might have actually touched on it in in that book I'm thinking of about mm -hmm. like, I don't know why I'm rem like, I have this vision of like David two and boys Jonathan, going maybe? into a tent. Maybe. Like, it was, but like, huh. I, yeah, I don't think, again, we'll see. She she did not shy away from sex and sexuality in her writing. Oh, okay. so it would not surprise me to that some inkling of that made it through to my psyche, mm. even way back when. Oh, we're unpacking some shit on this episode. Oh yeah. boy! <laughs> well, welcome to my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you thought this was a podcast about your books? It's not. nope. We're fixing my brain. That's okay. No. <laughs> What other influences have you had uh, as a writer, as a reader? Like, who do you love? What have you loved? I don't think I've ever shied away from from praising T.J. Clune. I read his Wolf Song was the first book I ever read of his, and it changed my life. I mean, he's so fantastic with what he writes, but also how he writes it. And there are times that I'm like, man, if I could write as poetically as he does, then I would feel like I've I've accomplished what I've set out to do. <laughs> um, so I really, reading his books definitely helped me, which is hard like attributing another author because I never want anyone to think I'm ever copying someone else. Mm. But it's more just yeah. getting the feel of how he of how he wrote his stories and how he brought those stories, like I guess to me as the reader. I was like, man, I, I, that's how I want to bring my stories to people. So... Yeah, I adore TJ Clute and everything he's ever written. Um, and I see quite a few parallels there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Cool. Like deeply relatable, flawed characters who mean well but mm -hmm. make mistakes. Yeah. You know. One there's, time, there's... there was one time that a reader put on Facebook, hey, those of you who said that you like TJ Clune, you should read Fire and Brimstone. And I legit freaked out. Like I texted my sister. <laughs> I texted my best friend. I I like I died. I couldn't even Did believe it. Did you take it. a screenshot so you like you can use it later to like cheer yourself? Oh up yeah, I took thing? a picture of okay. it and yeah, <laughs> sent it to my family. Awesome. And I was just like, I yeah, I was I couldn't even believe that someone would say that people who like T.J. Clune should read my books. I was fangirling. I couldn't even handle it. So, <laughs> well, I'll co-sign that they should. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think. I mean the the. Th well, actually, a lot of the themes are the same. I was going to say the exact plot points are different. Oh, like, yeah. Yes. You know, and like, no, because he, he did plenty of like male, male romance, explicit stuff, too. So like. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would say if you're coming from T.J. Clune's 
current work and you've never gone through his back catalog, yes. just be aware that yeah. this is going to get steamy. Yeah. <laughs> but That's other true. than that, and okay. TJ hasn't, to my knowledge, written about specifically angels, although it, I happen to know he has written about death and the afterlife. Well, Into This um, River I Drown, didn't that have a... I thought that wasn't well. It was all right. Well, we're gonna have to cut this part. Oh, now I have to admit that I haven't read that book. Oh, I do actually have the audio. Oh, okay, on my phone or in my Audible account. But I, okay. yeah, I I haven't completely made my way through the entire T.J. Klune catalog. Okay. I mean, so I haven't either. I'll admit I, that too. Yeah. I haven't read every book he's ever written. Right. Well, because there's so many of them, will just murder your heart. Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, the last one I read based on like the recommendation of the Clunatics was John and Jackie, and I basically died. I uh, yeah, so I, I was too and scared. Then I, and then I yelled at the person who recommended it, and I said, "Never again, <laughs> never again." Yeah, unless I get to narrate it, and then I would read it again. Yeah, but, I heard that one's a heavy hitter. I haven't read that one. Oh boy, I have not been prepared emotionally for it. So, and yeah. you shan't be. You Never shan't be ready. There's, oh, no, man. no. One cannot be ready. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's just, again, it's delivering an emotional kick to the balls, mm-hmm. which some people do so well. Yep. Yeah. And then you say, thank you. Can I have some more? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. So other than TJ, who we all agree is fantastic and we like yeah. a lot and he's a pretty decent guy. Well, uh, have you read The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern? No. No? Oh, it's very good. Tell me all about it. Um, well, I, I I, mean, I honestly couldn't. I wouldn't even know how to describe it. But it's a very in-depth story that will not make sense until the end. But the way in which she writes and also her, she's also wrote another, another book, um, The Night Circus, which is also good, but I think Starless Sea is better because there's also some queer some queer representation. So, but the way that she writes is just it's it's almost poetry, which is just another thing that I like would aim to do because if I can write a fictional prose, and yet people would be like people who maybe don't read poetry would be enjoying it as a prose, and yet come away thinking that I just wrote some poetry, I feel like that'd be pretty cool. So that book was recommended to me by my sister and that was, it's very good and it's just beautifully written. So that also, I guess it's had an impact on how I want to deliver my books to people, like how I want my books to come across to readers. It's kind of with that same type of beauty, I guess. So what is on the horizon for Nicole Knight? This coming Friday, um, the book that I wrote together with Lily Main releases. It's the first book in our collaborated series, um, Queer Monster Romance. So, <gasps> love it. Book one releases Friday. So, I'm really excited about that. Uh, working with Lily has been so awesome. Uh, she's a gem. So, it's been super fun writing with her. And then I'm also a part of the charity Faded Mates anthology that releases uh, September 1st. And if you like funny stuff, that the, the, my short story for that one, it's essentially, it's, it's a rom-com. I, th- I think it's funny. And I texted my sister all of the different jokes and I said, hey, do these jokes land? And she said they were funny too. So I have the endorsement of myself and my sister that I'm funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's essentially my main character summons a demon and shenanigans ensue. So love it. I'm very excited about that story, which is going to be part of that anthology. I'm hoping before the end of the year, I finish the third uh, book in my Foxy Gentleman's Club series. So that's next on the horizon. So I need to know about King Dude. King Dude? The, the oh, yeah. My rooster. killer rooster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I grew up. Well, OK. So most of my childhood memories comes from when we lived on the farm. And I only recently realized that we only lived there for like a year and a half. And yet for me, it's like my entire childhood. But I lived on a farm uh, in Indiana and we had a whole host of animals. And one of them was a rooster and we named him King Dude. And he was the worst. He would attack us anytime we went to go (laughs) collect the eggs. And so as like a child, that was one of my chores. I would (laughs) 
I would go, I would walk from our garage to the chicken coop with a shovel and I would use it to <laughs> smack him to like get him away because he'd run at you with his claws out or claws, his talons. And he was horrible. He was so mean. And I was terrified because I'm like seven or eight at the time. So yeah, it was just my eight-year-old self with this ginormous snow shovel and I would whack him and uh, <laughs> to get him away from me so that I could collect the eggs. And yeah, and I took him as my show and tell. To, oh man, I am I'm revealing way too much about myself. Um, I was homeschooled <laughs> as a child. <laughs> oh my God. I was also homeschooled. Um, I promise I'm cool. Okay. So we, went, <laughs> we, yeah, there was a homeschool group that we would all get together sometimes because we weren't in actual school and we had a show and tell one time and we were allowed to bring an animal. So my sister brought our dog. My other sister brought her mini pig and I brought the rooster. And so I had a rooster on a leash. And that's probably when he became evil because he didn't like us after that. So that's his origin story. King Dude, the worst. So I think I think we've come full circle and answered the question, who hurt you? Yeah, <laughs> it was King Dude. It was King, King Dude. Dude. It was the oh evil rooster God. from my childhood. Yep. <laughs> All trauma can lead back there. <laughs> <laughs> The question has been answered. Yes, yep. so we got so there. <laughs> Anything else you would want our listeners to know about you and your work? Just that I love what I do. And I hope that other readers can feel that when they're reading my stories. And please read my books. <laughs> <laughs> Best marketing ever. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time and for staying up late yes, so that we no can problem. do this halfway across the world. We really appreciate it. And we yes. hope you'll come back. I, I hope so. This was super fun. And I'm very appreciative that you invited me to be here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's been our pleasure. Thank you so much. So I was so glad that I finally had a chance to actually like talk to them mm -hmm. um, and give them a little bit of shit about what they put us through yeah. in those books. Yeah, we deep dive into some fun stuff in mm -hmm. that conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can uh, get Nicole's latest book, Whispers in the Dark, which was the collaboration with uh, Lily Main that they talked about in our interview. Um, you can get that right now. And then you can also pick up the entire Fire and Brimstone series in either ebook print or might I recommend audio? Hmm. That mm. sounds good. You know. I think I'll pick up audio. Yeah. Uh, so that whole series and one entire like novel in that world is also available uh, wherever you get audiobooks. Yeah. Uh, and then you can find all the ways to connect with Nicole in the show notes for this episode. Awesome. And you can also find out how to connect with us yeah. in the show notes for this episode. <laughs> um, we want to hear from you. We especially want you to go... Sign up for our Patreon. You can do it now for free yes. so that we can interact with you and we can let you know when new things are coming down the pike uh, and you can vote in that upcoming poll. Yes, definitely jump on. It, like like we've said many times, free. Or, you know, you free. can do it free, free. totally free. <laughs> it's basically just you have to make an account and then you can vote on which book we should do mm -hmm. next. So, so uh, everybody have a wonderful week. Uh, we will be here again next week, Friday. Yep in your podcast feed and we look forward to talking at you then <laughs> yes we'll see you then bye bye